Hi and welcome to another episode of Journey to a Dream brought to you by Kawasaki Insurance. I keep saying that this podcast is about trying to find out what makes road racers really want to do what they do. And as I speak, we are just ahead of MGP 2024. And today's guest is someone who has raced over here before, but has had quite a big break really and is back. Let's meet him now. Hi, my name's Ian Solu. I run and race for a team called BD Racing. We're based in Bristol in the UK. Primarily race with Andreas over in the Isle of Man and Bemsey, which is the club in the UK where I instruct as well. I just want to ask you, first of yep. all, your surname, Solu, where does that come from? It originates from Belgium. So, funny enough, a town, I think it's Cambrai, which I've probably really messed up the pronunciation but it's where the first tank battle was really? sort of during the First World War. So, yeah, went over there and found the town where the name comes from. So we're speaking today, Ian, and I just kind of, I almost want to apologise on behalf of the Isle of Man for the weather that you're facing as we are recording this podcast. You came over yesterday on the boat in bright sunshine, rocked up to the paddock, fortunately managed to get the awning up by about 9pm last night and woke up to, well, what can only be described really as torrential downpours. The weather's always part of the island. You can come over in the winter and it's bright, sunny. You can be in the... In 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 the summer and it's raining like you know the contrast from yesterday was amazing really really lovely crossing and then today we're playing spot that leak in the truck yeah it's it's part of the fun it's part of the character and you don't get green without rain we're going to talk a little bit about your journey back here for the mgp this year but just first of all let's go back to where it all started for you and the first bike related memory that you have Right back to the beginning, I think it's definitely going to be, it's going to be my dad. So I was born and grew up in East London and lived there till I was about 10 or 11. And remember as a child, we never had a car. So dad didn't pass his driving test till he was 27, 28. Mum had had a driving license from being 17, but we never had a car. So yeah, between me, my brother and my sister, it was only when my sister was born that we actually got a car. Dad used to be a, used to be a road instructor examiner as part-time as, as well as his normal work. So bikes have always been part of it. But I didn't think it was a it was an unusual childhood because it was just growing up. Then latterly we moved to Bristol and always had pictures of bikes on the wall, races on the wall. And then I got my first moped at 16, which was a present from my parents. Really quite an emotional day because I didn't expect any of it at all. And we'd found the bike a couple of months earlier and I was really disappointed that Dad couldn't strike a deal to buy it. But unbeknown to me, he'd bought it and hidden it in my aunt's garage. I started racing when I was 17, 18, so I bought a bike off a friend that had crashed, turned it into a race bike, which probably meant I made it worse because I didn't know anything about building race bikes at 17, 18. And then, yeah, kind of worked through from production 125s, did some British 125 championship stuff. So, yeah, racing's always, always been part of it, always been part of the background. And has the Isle of Man always featured somewhere? Hell no. I, when I was racing the GP stuff, I'm trying to remember who it was. It might have been someone like Steve Patrickson or Lee Jackson or somebody back in back in the 90s suggested that I go road racing. Because so fairly smooth, not particularly massively quick, I guess, on the short circuit. You know, enough to score points at British Championship level. So it was suggested that I go and ride or do the TT or do the Manx. And it just seemed, frankly, ridiculous. It was going to take all of my budget. It just seemed dangerous. Buy a CBR 600 was the suggestion. Treat it like a ride on the road and sell it when you get home. But I'd never ridden anything on the road bigger than a 125. So it was never an option and, and college was in the way with work. And So fast forward into, crikey, when would it be? It probably would have been about the mid-2000s. A friend of mine, Sarah Pooley, now Sarah Bartlett, spent years convincing me to come to the island, just on holiday, come over with her dad and some friends and make a holiday. And eventually in 2014, I relented and came over. Remember her phoning up the day before we left saying, Dad's on the phone to the Steam Packet, do you want to book for next year? I said, well, I've not been this year, so, OK, go on then, fine, put me down for a deposit, I'll come back next year. And then, I don't know, something just something just clicked. I can't remember who it was, but we watched from St Ninian's and I've seen bikes fast, I've ridden bikes fast, I've, I've seen the noise, heard the noise on the dyno and there was something in me that just, it just prickled the back of my neck. We had a conversation about it, I was told to be on best behaviour and ride in the middle of the group so I didn't get any ideas and I bought a bike at senior presentation to do the Manx the following year. <laughs> I almost wish we could have captured that moment when you saw that first bike go past. It was brilliant. I, th- I think it might have been Guy Martin on one of the Tower Suzuki's or something like that. But literally, it was just a wow moment. And I remember we had a conversation about where Gorse Lee was. And, and, you know, my friends had been regulars. And I got it right. I remember Sarah's dad saying to me, 
for somebody on holiday, you're paying a lot of attention. It, it just... It gets you. You can't really explain it. Something I actively avoided and then suddenly... But it's interesting, isn't it, though? Because for people who just enjoy watching it, so I can watch them go past and think, wow, that's amazing. Not one shred of my brain is going, oh, I'd like to do that. So you've got to have that urge in you somewhere already. And I mean, I don't know whether it's, is it being a bit of a, a daredevil, just liking the risk element? Could you define what that thing is? The crazy thing is, in work, I'm an aircraft engineer. So I'm an aircraft designer. There's lots of focus on compliance. There's lots of focus on repetition and analysis. And day to day, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't admit I'm a particularly risky or adventurous kind of guy. There must be something in there. And I'm sure if you probably talk to my friends, they would probably say something different. And one of the comments that keeps coming up is they think I suffer from squirrels. So, yeah, one of, a couple of my nephews have been diagnosed with ADHD. So they sort of think that, if there's an idea, I'll ping off onto the next one. It's, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because your friend, Sarah, who encouraged you to come over here with her dad, clearly must have known there was going to be something in it for you. I think they thought I'd enjoy it, but i will probably get to the stage in, in the racing on the circuit stuff where I was looking at changing things anyway. So 2014 was also the year I started instructing with Bemsey in the ACU. So it was almost like a kind of handing over the baton kind of thing. But I didn't expect the baton to be going roads racing. I'd never done a roads race before. I don't even think I'd been to Aberdeer at that time. Never been to Scarborough. And literally, my first taste of roads racing was rolling down behind Nick Jeffries doing my newcomer's lap. So you bought this bike then at the senior presentation. Did you know what was going to be involved in terms of things like getting signatures and, and the process that would be involved to getting you onto the start line? When I bought the bike, no. The only way I can describe it was like booking a holiday and not even knowing if the resort exists. I didn't know if it was possible. I was... My 40th birthday was just before... Just before I did Newcomers in 2015. So I wasn't even sure that I'd be eligible to do it. I mean, obviously, I was doing enough racing and at a good enough level, getting signatures and and probably qualifying wasn't a problem. But I didn't... You know, getting a ferry to come over and watch it was hard enough. Getting somewhere to stay was hard enough. It was almost like joining a secret club. So from that perspective, I yeah, I didn't have a clue. But it, it was almost like it wasn't not going to happen. And then, ironically enough, it didn't happen on that bike. Why was that? So I bought a bike off a friend of mine, Gabrielle Byrne. I think she won the Leslie Ann Trophy in about 2012. And ironically, going back when Gabs started her race career, she got her first signature on one of my bikes because she'd had a mechanical problem and I'd lent her a bike and she'd got her first signature. At, I think it was Lyndon Hill. So there's, there's connections and things and, and, you know, really nice that you can kind of repay the favour. But the bike just... We just couldn't get any reliability out of the bike. So I think in the run-up to it, I think I rode or raced about 10 different bikes to get enough signatures. So I was doing loads of stuff and trying different things because it was just... Everything needed to happen for the Manx. It, it, became, it does become consuming quite quickly. And then... Around about Christmas time, there was an advert from a chap called Billy McKinstry. I think it was on Facebook or something like that. And I'd, so I I'd asked the question to Pooley if she knew anything about Billy. And it turned out that her dad and Billy worked together previously. So I'm sure conversations had in, happened in the background. And really at the last minute, the, the deal came together. So I got to ride one of Billy's bikes. And James Chalk uh, was my teammate, which was surreal in itself. You know, I sat in the awning chatting to Dean Harrison and Ivan Linton and, and James Chalk, starting to get really good over in Ireland. And I just, just felt like a fish out of water. I thought, what have I done? But, yeah, brilliant. What an experience. What a place What a place to learn to do your first road race on. And I'm guessing, like most of the people I speak to, you mentioned setting off behind Nick Jeffries for that newcomer's lap. Memories of that will be quite clear for you. Yeah, literally, I think we were in groups of about nine or ten or something, because I did Newcomers B, so I was on the lightweight class. I think James Short was first away, so it was the first group of ten. And I kind of expected, you know, because you roll up to the start line and you, you come to the paddock and it's a 30 mile an hour. So I did a what I could only describe as a Valentino Rossi. I stood up, I pulled the levers out of my bum, and by the time I looked up, everyone had gone. You know, because I, I'm sure, you know, suddenly Bray Hill, 120, 150 mile an hour on a twin. And and they went. I didn't catch up with them until we got to between Quarter Bridge and Braddon Bridge. So the first part was a complete blur. I mean, Nick was following the line and what we were told of the lines. But, but 10 people following it, everyone just wanted to get out of position to have a look. In hindsight, it was probably quite chaotic. I think now it's a bit more organised. And I know with club, we probably just maybe have three people per instructor. Bloody good fun, though. And certainly enough to make you 
want to carry on and, and to go through the process of qualifying. What do you remember about the week? The weather was rubbish. My dad came over for the first 10 days to watch me. What was your dad's reaction to you doing it? They've come to watch me race before and Dad's been, Dad's been quite active in helping out and stuff. Uh, Mum, I think she used to watch from the caravan. I don't think she's ever actually seen me ride or seen me race. But yeah, no, Dad was, was up for it. He was quite disappointed because the weather was bad and there was a couple of incidents and stuff. In the 10 days he was over, he didn't see me do a complete lap because we'd go off from the pit lane and come in at the north gate. So he was quite disappointed. So the first flying lap I got was when he was on the flight on the way back to Bristol. So I think he was gutted to not see that. But yeah, it was, it, it, it was a struggle. We didn't get many laps in. The weather wasn't kind. Newcomer's race was shortened to three laps. Which must have been frustrating from your point of view. I think, was it the newcomers and the super twin that you did that year? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's probably a bit like joining the army. There's a lot of hurry up and wait, you know, because the bikes are prepared and taken up through scrutiny in, you know, lunchtime, mid-afternoon. And they might sit there till tea time. I think my newcomers lap, the first lap I did on my own, didn't go till about 8, 8.30. So the sun was really quite low. It was a bit awkward. A massive character building. And in terms of expectations of yourself and what you wanted to achieve in that first race, did you did you have anything or was it just enough to finish? All I wanted was a finish. Like I said, it was my first time on the roads. I'd never even ridden the bike. I didn't meet the, the team until I arrived here. So I got here, I don't know, like Tuesday or Wednesday and then we went, I think it was Saturday for the newcomers lap. So I had a good time, good while to meet the team and, and, and try and understand how it was working. But it was really... Everything was so fresh, everything was so new. Yeah, I just, just wanted to finish. And then we got, to, I remember getting to the start line and the half an hour, three quarters of an hour before is really horrible. It, everything kind of comes to a head. And as you go into no man's land, I remember thinking to myself, if somebody had tapped me on the shoulder and we said, we know you're up for this lad, you can get off now. In that moment, I'd have probably got off the bike. And I remember looking up at the crowds thinking, to get a finish, I've got to get a start. And then you just go into a, a, I don't know, a zone or start process and you just watch for that light and the little flag to drop and then second or third gear. You're just trying to get your markers, you're doing what you've been told, you're trying to breathe, you're checking the revs, you're checking the temperature gauge. It feels like a whole load of nothing when you're doing it. You're just so focused on trying to get it right. And I've spoken to other people about this before because it's a lot to concentrate for such an amount of time. And as you said, there's so many things that as the person in control of that machine, you have to be aware of to make sure it's going OK. And I don't know how you do that while making sure you're in the right lines as well. The weird thing is, it's it, what you notice and what you don't notice is strange. I mean, I've not, I've not done as many laps as, as, as most of people, you know, lots of people here. But you notice if somebody's got a barbecue on, you know, which direction the wind's blowing. You, you could smell it or I can't smell it this lap. What's, has it changed? Just bizarre. You've got information overload and you're just trying to... The biggest thing for me was trying to ignore it. It's almost like your senses are heightened in some way. Mm. But it's trying to filter it out. It's like, is that bump? Is that vibration? Uh, no, no, no. Just just stay calm. Let the bike do the work. Stay calm. Breathe. Stay calm. It is really different to, to short circuit racing. I mean, the guys at the front who are really, really pushing on and, and probably bringing in more of a short circuit style, how they concentrate if I watch one of Hickey's on boards or something like that, even I'm amazed. So that newcomer's race, I think you've got a 10th place finish, which is phenomenal for a yeah. first time out. I was over the moon to start with because I think I spent most of the weekend, didn't get many laps, not, didn't know the bike. I think it was most of the weekend or most of the qualifying. I was probably in about 17th, 18th, 19th. And it kind of, it started to click and it started to work. And then unfortunately, my teammate James crashed at Tower. It was okay. So that was, I think that was halfway through the second lap. And were you aware that that had happened? Yeah, yeah. I came past him and I gave him the thumbs up and he beckoned me to carry on going and get my head down. What does that do from a confidence point of view? you just in the moment. you just sort of just got this to do. It was, you know, James was starting 10 seconds up the road. I didn't, didn't expect to see him all week. Um, so to kind of see him, I mean, it was, it was bittersweet because, you know, he was one of the race favourites. Him, him and Gary Vines. Yeah, so you know, it was a bit. It was a bit of a shock. The, the funnier part was towards the end of the lap when I remember coming out of the Craig and somebody held up a chalkboard with the number ten on it, and I think it might have been Drew who, who was helping Billy out. And I thought, ten? What does ten mean? Oh, oh, hang on a minute. And I remember pulling all of my tear offs off in one go because I was wasn't really concentrating on anything at all, and it just I think it was fifty two or something like that. So I was like, where does where, what does ten mean? Didn't didn't expect to see number ten at all. I was absolutely made up to finish, uh, and and to get a top ten finish was was over the moon. And then I walked into the office and realised that I hadn't won a replica. I think I'd missed out by about two seconds. And um, somebody looked at me and said, "See you again next year." <laughs> 
And you did come back did come in back. 2016 and yep. you were in the Super Twin race again. But I don't think you finished that race. What happened? No, it was a different year. We had more laps. We had, we had good laps. I mean, we had a few technical problems with the bike, but when it was running, everything was great. And then on the race, I remember pulling away and the start wasn't brilliant, but the bike didn't feel right going through St Ninian's. The clutch wasn't right. It was spinning. It wasn't really picking up on the bumps. So I pulled in at Quarter Bridge to make some adjustments adjusted the clutch and got as far as Balacrane and it was just just not going to happen pulled in at Balacrane met some really nice really nice marshals at Balacrane and Jim Hunter the travelling marshal was there you had Sarah and Ray Priseman um, and Ian Thompson who marshals up at Jerby as well so we had a good chat I had some lemon drizzle cake Sarah does make some really nice lemon drizzle cake Ray is a lucky man and then Jim came over and said are you still making adjustments or have you retired and I had to say I was retiring so that was the other surreal thing was was riding back on the roads because I could manage to nurse the bike back I think it's is it through Foxdale and back through Douglas um, riding up the prom on a race bike did feel decidedly naughty so there were there was there was there was good feelings and then the van was coming around to pick us up so they knew where I'd pulled up so yeah so that was 2016 why weren't you back in 2017 Back to 2015. At the end of 2015, I did the endurance race at Jerby. Did that with Davy Morgan and Joe Broomfield. Joe is the stepson of John Batty, between John and Davy, were my liaisons. Because again, I didn't do my instruction laps until the TT. Everything was really late. So, I, you know, people are coming over now for doing like, the Howards weekends and the Newcomers weekends through the winter. I didn't do any of that until TT. It was all. But I think because I was older and because I was instructing with the ACU. I was probably seen as a bit safer. Um, so I did all that. So, yeah, so myself, Davy, and Joe, and Joe raced. I think it might have been Joe's SV650 twin. And we won the Super Twins class at the four hour endurance race at Jerby. So that was really nice. Good way to end the season. Fast forward to 16. We'd managed to get the SV650 working and got some good power and got reliable. And that was from a lot of work that I did with JHS Racing, so in Bristol. And then for 16 myself joe and a local guy called andy fenton raced the bike and i think at one point i think we were we might have been i think fenton put the bike in pole on pole position for qualifying and i think we were running in second or second or third in class and we run out of fuel with a couple of minutes to go so fenton pushed the bike back in we were credited with a finish and and that kind of formed a relationship with with JHS. So then 2017, it was meant to be myself and, and Andy Fenton on, on the SV650s, so riding for JHS. And, yeah, it kind of, last minute, everything fell through for me. But Andy was having a good ride, and you know, with the JHS bike in 17. So, yeah, it was a bit bittersweet, to, so I went fishing, put oh. the radio on and listened to the Manx. Oh, you were able to listen to it? Yeah, I don't oh. think they were particularly amused at the lakeside when I was fishing, but I really wasn't in the mood for talking to anyone about it. Oh, that must have been so, so tough, Ian. But you have then come back here. Here we are in 2024. Was there no point between 2016 and, and now that you thought, oh, I want to be back every, there? Every year. I'd, I'd, I'd applied, I think most years since then, I'd applied to run something, to run a twin or to run, run a 600. Kind of started doing some more team building stuff in the UK, so hence where the, the BD racing came from. So and That's your own team? Yeah, yeah. so that was set up. Started really making it as, a, as a, something a bit official in sort of 2018, 2019. So always been helping young talent through racing and stuff. And I think it was 2016, 2017 with the KTM Cup. One of my rookies, I paid for him to do a wild card at Snetterton. I think it was seven. Good to, to kind of give young talent a nudge in the right direction. And it, it kind of then became a thing in the background. So as well as wanting to do the roads, I was still doing the instructing and then bringing on. So the team, we won a championship in 2019. So Thunderbike Sport won one of the CBR 600s I've got. Got a bunch of lap records with Bemsey. Yeah, so obviously covid it kind of was a bit of a bit of a pickle for everyone but just before i snapped my achilles or ruptured my achilles so 2020 was a bit of a, a washout season for me which actually timed with covid i suppose gave you time to recover it was strange i was i, I did it in the january playing squash again nothing to do with bikes nothing to do with anything particularly dangerous it was just 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 playing squash in work at the time, I was earmarked to be like the, not the rider rep, but like the instructor for working with or helping out the, the juniors on the Kawasaki Ninjas at Bemsey, Team Green Junior Cup. So obviously I couldn't do that because it, it was a week or two before rookie school. But it actually worked out 
in, in a stranger it worked out quite well and it kind of sent in a different direction because it allowed me to work with a couple of the individuals whereas if I'd have been the the group instructor I you know you can't focus on on anyone in particular you've got to give everyone the same time so we worked with a young lad called Fred McMullen Fred had some good results I think he finished third in the championship in the end and then the following year we did a wild card with BSB and World Superbikes at Donington that was big boy pants which again you know there's lots of processes procedures and I'm kind of comfortable even though I'm not really a big rule person but there is a comfort in knowing the the process and the procedure and then Fred went on to do BSB in 2023 had a full time ride on, on an R3 so you know we'd kind of nudge people in a good direction but coming back to the max had always been in the background and started racing at andreas a couple of years ago it was almost a way to come over to the island because i like it on the island but it was a way to do some racing but have some downtime from club because when you're instructing with a club kind of have to maintain the standard there's a sense of responsibility exactly so to come over and do something completely different it was just like a mini holiday and linda alton he she's an absolute dynamo i didn't until i listened to a podcast i didn't realize quite how much she's done in the background and how much she does and you've got Liz Ward and the, the race secretary everyone was just so welcoming so helpful so it was just nice to come over and be away and it's, it's just kind of grown from that and it feels like there's a real racing family element to it it's brilliant there's like a real can-do attitude I mean I've come over and I think the last time I think I've forgotten an extension lead I've forgotten some bits and pieces and Dickie Gale lent us an extension lead so I ended up jumping on with Dave Marshall because it was a sidecar passenger sort so the Gales could get their last signature so we had enough people to make a race Wow, how was that? It was brilliant I mean I've had a sidecar licence for a couple of years and I, but I sort of tend to jump on I don't know probably probably once, twice, three times a year but I did buy a pair of levers from Andy Haynes this year so the the plan is to do some more passenger in. So okay, we're going to watch the space on that one. Yeah, I mean it's really weird. I'm a nervous passenger. I was going to say there must be something about normally being in control and actually not having as much control, although still a, a crucial role as a passenger. And when you're active doing it, it, it feels okay because you, you do feel you've got something to do. But I remember doing laps over the mountain with John, and I think he only had like a Vauxhall, and and in the back window there was a, a, a monkey that would vibrate. And at about 80 or 90, the, you could hear this, this stick-on monkey would vibrate against the window. And I would feel myself gripping onto the, the handles. And, and even if Joe takes us over in the car, I mean, bless him, Joe came along and helped us last night pitch up. And obviously, being, you know, using working from Davy's truck, it was kind of emotional for everyone. And let's just explain that. So it's Davy Morgan's truck. So I've got Davy yeah. Morgan's truck. How did that come about? Just literally just saw it advertised, and it was perfect for what we were going to do. And had some conversations with Morris and a few of the guys and Trudy and just said well is anyone going to worry seeing it in the paddock if it's still working and and the belief was that people wanted to see it working yeah picking it up was a bit emotional especially when one of the cds came on that was still in the cd player but you know everyone loves the food and and again i'd never driven a lorry never driven anything that big before and so we met some friends at at the ballymac for morris who who, you know helped davy out we met them at the ballymac for tea Completely forgot about the time because having a really good time chatting about old times and, and meeting new friends and stuff. So we had to go take the lorry back to the port to obviously bring it back over to over to England. And as we were driving back, some, some friends, Caroline and Rodney, said, follow us, we'll take you to the motorway. It's the easiest way to get to the port. Ed sat next to us. He just shouting directions and we go in a completely different direction. And the lanes get smaller and more narrow. And then we get to this really tight junction at the top of this hill. And he looks at me and he says, doesn't Belfast look great tonight? And he gave me directions and we drove through the centre of Belfast in a lorry I'd never sat in two hours before. Literally, I was the most nervous driver ever. And we sat down on the boat and he literally just dropped a Yorkie bar and a coffee in front of me. And he said, you've earned that, boy. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was brilliant. It was, it was good fun. So, so yeah, no, it's been it, it's been a journey with the truck. And when I brought the truck over to, to race with Andreas, you can't miss it. It's bright big and red. But setting it up and all the rest of it, we really wouldn't have been able to have done it without Joe's help. And that's the thing that, that we keep coming back to throughout this podcast is it's all very well being the rider on the race track, but there's a whole team of people that really make sure that you're able to be there and doing all sorts of things that actually the people who were just watching on the sidelines possibly have no idea about no i mean this this morning i had a message from a friend of mine chloe so she's a physio her husband was one of my rookies in 2018 so you know it's really great that people have stayed in touch and you know she's asking me if i'm relaxing if i'm taking enough fluids on everyone's been really nice and i'm probably a bit independent and probably a bit too headstrong and i don't 
always realised the help and the people around me. Coming over this time has been different because, you know, before when I've been racing, I've been racing for Billy, but actually doing it myself, there's so many favours I've had to call in. There's so many things. But, it really, yeah, it's been really nice, and I find everyone over here really lovely. I mean, Zoe Ball dropped us up this more, uh, this afternoon to, to do the podcast. You know, everyone's really chipped in, everyone's pitched in. It's, yeah. I should say you were planning on cycling up, but it was so horrific a little bit earlier. Although, can you see? There's a little bit of brightness oh. there as we look out now. It does so, look, yeah, there is, a, there is a strange blueness to yes, the sky. it's coming. You said that you had applied to do the MGP and, and for whatever reason um, hadn't been successful since 2016 and then various other things happened. I just want to know, Ian, when you realise that 2024 was a goer can you remember that moment and thinking oh what have I done probably not until not until the entries are confirmed at the end was it the end of June beginning of July I mean literally to talk about the Manx or this year because I'd applied for the centenary year and didn't get a space and I've been running a, a ZX6 for a couple of years which was built specifically to do the Manx so I didn't really think it was a thing and then over the winter I've been having some conversations with a young lad called Reece Stevenson so we'd come back from Red Bull Rookies and I think ideally he wanted to be back in the BSB paddock. He's a Lincolnshire lad, so the, the Manx was, or going in that direction, was seen as like option two, the same as, I think, Peter Hickman, one of his idols. So we did some stuff and he ridden, rode the blade over the winter because I've got a fire blade as well. And he came over to the island and in, I think it was there, the, the Andreas, like the rookie school day, so it was typical Manx weather big splashy puddles and young Reese had never I don't think he'd ever ridden anything bigger than a 250 okay at Red Bull rookie level but suddenly I'm letting him loose on a 160 horsepower fire blade with no traction control on a splashy track he'd never ridden before we had some conversations and I said look I said nobody doubts you're quick just whatever you do just make it look easy but he has got a lovely riding style and then subsequently they, they pulled a deal together to be able to go back to BSB in the, the sport bike class on a Triumph I think there's a connection with Peter Hickman, which kind of left... The, the, the groundwork was there for doing a lightweight. So I thought, well, OK, I'll put an entry in and see what happens. And, yeah, so then here I am. <laughs> here you are. And we are sitting here talking on the Thursday before MGP gets underway on Sunday. And I, I don't know whether you'd be able to give us a, a sense of what the next few days look like for you, what's going through your mind. Have you got your your team together and everything? How is it all looking? Um, team are built. I mean, literally, Ed come over with us in the truck. Logistics Ed is his nickname. Everything in the background, all the, the messaging, all the socials. Eddie is all over that. So I think he's had... I don't know, probably about 50 mugs delivered and a million key rings. So one of the one of the Bemsey club instructors, a former club instructor, a guy called Gary Jarman, has lent us his ZXR 400. So I've had to get familiar with that over the last few weeks. JHS have been really good at, at, at helping me with that. Ironically enough, when we won the Endurance in 15, I think that bike won the endurance in the 400 class as well with Gary's daughter Emma so there's, there's all these connections all these things that you don't ever realize yeah so we've got some people are coming over as the week goes on and, and yeah everyone's pitching in and chipping in and helping out and I just wonder Ian when you're here it's obviously something that you've wanted to do for a long time but you've got so much to prepare and so much to think about how do you manage to switch off a little bit I think the only moment I did switch off was we drove off the ferry and we pulled into Douglas there was just a moment where I thought this is nice. That was um, it, was it? A fleeting moment? Literally, because I, I was saying, you know, Ed, on the, on the way up, it's like, well, as long as we can get the truck to Douglas, well, it can park on the prom and we can, we can carry everything up the hill. But then it starts again. You start pitching up the tent and people come, you know, people mucked in to help. And then every, even if we sat down, we went for a quiet drink afterwards and I'm unfortunate, well, no, I'm, I'm on unleaded until... Until the um, until the race is done, so I think I had a Guinness zero. There are other other zeros available, but yeah, no. And even sat there, you know, and people are chatting and congratulating on the job well done, and you know. But in the back of your mind, there's always that always that thing. Did I do this? What have I got to do? There's bits of lock wire in this. How are we going to move the things around? What's it going to look like in the awning? So we've got teas and coffees and stuff, and that's starting to happen. And now the hopefully the rain will stop, and we can get all the tools out and things, and get the bike area set up. It never stops. Never stops. Even no. Even even driving. Even driving the truck up. There's always thinking. What's the pitch going to be like? Where are we going? Where are they going to place us? What it's almost like running on adrenaline, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'll sleep really well the night after the race. But I mean, in some ways, I'm kind of glad that it's only been about a month or so because you know the idea was thrown out there and it was it was kind of parked. It wasn't really 
it wasn't really a thing you know and I've been doing other things in the background instructing and, and getting to the point where looking to step aside properly and then it's like you, you've never had that conversation before it's just everything becomes totally fresh and it becomes all about the Manx are you able to put into words what MGP means to you then <sighs> oh, oh I crikey it's for something that I never wanted to be involved with didn't care for it's like everything is turned up to 11 you know as soon as you go out there and you're trying to relax in probably one of the most stressful places you can be you know and you 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 can't afford to make a mistake you can't there isn't any time to rest i'm sure it's the same all the the way through all the levels you know everyone is putting in the same amount of effort and concentration and i'm glad i've kept trying i'm glad i've kept nibbling away at it and 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 i'm glad i I really am really am made up and feel really privileged to have a chance to race again and it's interesting because you mentioned the instructing i think you've also done marshalling so you kind of have seen racing from from every different angle and i wonder what that does for you as a racer sort of understanding all the different parts of it i I think i've been done a bit and, and, and and again listening to some of the podcasts and seeing listening to people's experiences you can see how it how it gives them an understanding and, and even things take for granted that you know the clerk of the course neil champion you know you know he's the clerk actually hang on a minute he can also ride a bit so they've seen it all they've heard it all and, and suddenly you kind of get an appreciation that maybe that's where i am as well you know i've been i've been racing for 30 years you know like i said you know everything from from managing a team on a world superbike weekend to actually marshalling you know i mean we was over at tt as well as marshalling short circuit stuff i marshaled the 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 junction the braking marker just up from parliament square it does look scary watching it when you're doing it it feels like you're in control it you know you're trying your damnedest to 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 not see the danger or, or to manage the danger when you watch them whizzing past a couple of feet away it becomes real again and is TT on the radar at all? Has it ever been? I n- never even thought Manx was on the radar. I don't know. I'll be fifty next year. I don't know if. I don't know. I don't know. I think we'll we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I guess if I get a win, you know, or a good result, then then maybe I'll get asked. But I think I'm back to where I was in 2015. I think a finish would be lovely. I'd love a replica. And you mentioned you've got a, a brother and a sister. Have either them into racing? Yeah, my brother did a bit of racing back in the kind of late 2000 2010 um and ironically enough because bemsey have got a sense of humor my preferred number is 65 and my brother was given the number 56 so i helped him out for a bit he's a lovely rider he won't always say it he's a lovely rider but that kind of turn it up to 11 being slightly unpredictable as a racer isn't really his thing but if i'm honest i think he's got a neater riding style than me so he's done a bit it, my nephew leo so for my brother's son He's won the 90cc British Junior Supermoto Championship and he's doing the route to MotoGP on the Ovalis, so the 110 and the 160s. So Leo's had a couple of wins. I think he's got a couple of lap records on some of the mini bikes. Um, he's doing yeah, he's doing really well. My sister, no, not interested at all. She's not mechanically minded. She's sensible, sensible. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned the day job being the the aircraft engineer. Yeah. I mean, how does that fit into everything else that you're doing? It can be difficult because it mainly getting the time off was a, was a problem i remember in 2015 so i'd started working on a project for airbus so i was signing off analysis calcs on a new aircraft and i told my program director that i was going to the isle of man for the manx grand prix and she looked at me and said have a great time and then when i came back three weeks later she'd obviously googled what the manx was and offered a couple of expletives and said thank you for coming back <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit of an eye-opener for a lot of people because the day job is so different you know i, I i've presented new variants of aircraft to the airworthiness authorities i presented design solutions to airbus directors you know various other companies and you know but yeah so it's it's completely different although there is a process there is a knowledge there is a it's understanding how things work yeah although i can be a bit analytical sometimes and probably just need to just get on with it well you mentioned the the social media presence and sort of keeping up to date with that if people want to know how bd racing is getting on over mgp where's the best place to go so we've got bd racing got facebook we've got instagram i'm 
honours BD Racing number one or something. Which, but yes, BD Racing Limited is the the Instagram tag. We've got Facebook. We've got X as well. I'm kind of kind of sport really because Eddie's X, he's X Army, he's X Royal Signals. So he is all about communication. He's all about the message. He literally anything in the background. He's an absolute dynamo with pushing. And because I'm racing number 51 again, so I was 51 in 16. I'm 51 again now. So we're doing a Club 51 promotion idea. So we're doing a, a raffle where you can win a team hoodie. And all the details about that will be online. It's all, on, all online. Perfect. Yeah, we've used the same suppliers as the actual MGP official merch. Is it Happy Dog? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So it's all good stuff. It's all, you know, so because again, part of me coming back here is as much about building the team and bringing and making directions for new talent coming through. We wish you all the very best for the next few days. And I say, we're looking out again. Oh, it's getting really bright now. Yeah. You can run back down to the grandstand. Can run back down to the grandstand. I think I, think I might stroll down here. I didn't realise... I saw it on the map and I know how steep it is to get down from the grandstand down to the prom and the harbour. And the harbour. I didn't realise how steep it was going to be coming up the other side. Do you know, when you said you might be cycling in a message, I thought, should I tell him? No, it'd be all right. be part of the fun. It'll be all right. Well, this is it. I mean, I've got a collection of 60s um, Moulton bicycles. They're full suspension, so you've got suspension on the front, suspension on the back. They look like vintage shopping bikes. I think it was the guy who did the mini suspension was involved in it or something. And and actually, for, for cycling around town, they're really quite they're really quite good. But they do get some funny looks. Have you brought one over with you? Yep, yep, yep. It's 1962 or 1964. We need a photograph of that, Ian. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. All being well, we will talk to you down in Park Verme and uh, keep up to date with how you're doing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the time. Ian Solu from BD Racing. Brilliant to catch up with him just as MGP is about to get started. Everything cross that he has a most successful week and that he gets that all-important replica. Something that we didn't actually get to during the recording, but he did mention on his way out, and it'd be wrong not to share it with you, is his music of choice as he prepares to head up to the start line. Turns out Ian is a little bit of a Swifty, so he's not going to be able to shake that one off, is he? Journey to a Dream is brought to you by Kawasaki Insurance. You can visit their website, kawasaki-insurance.co.uk. And as ever, if you'd like to be part of the podcast, do drop me an email, bethsb at manxradio.com. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.